We are in the second part of the course. We already covered one special topic. Today, we move on to the next one. So in the first special topic, we discussed rigid bird dynamics. Right? Um, and that's the case when an object can move, can translate and rotate a lot, but there is no strain in the material because it's at most pure rotation. Um, so now uh, we will discuss a case where there is strain, but this strain is small. Okay? And there could also be rotation, but the rotation is also small. So overall, the deformation is small. And we're going to uh, discuss this topic in the very special case of linear elasticity. It's a very special case, uh, but simultaneously it has a very broad application and it's the basis of many, let me say, nonlinear theories, uh, including inelastic deformations as well as large deformations. So this is a very good starting point towards uh, advanced topics of mechanics of uh, materials. Um, and it gives rise to a very robust theory as well, a theoretical setting within which you can uh, derive analytical solutions to many rather actually complex problems. So, uh, but that's a course on its own. We do have a uh, elective course precisely on that topic. Uh, we, I just want to give you a um, give you a, a brief overview of how linear elasticity is linked to what we have covered so far and uh, how it is in the context of the uh, special cases that, or the uh, things that I will mention, how it is linked to the undergraduate uh, mechanics concepts that we are familiar with. So uh, just as in the first special topic of rigid bird dynamics, it's going to be just mentioning a few ideas and seeing how this idea fits into our general continuum mechanics language framework. So uh, let me begin with, again, the classical picture. So we have a reference configuration. This reference configuration is R0. Okay? And we have, in general, a material point which can move okay, through the uh, motion function to some arbitrary point x. And every material point moves to a new location. And thereby, you can construct your uh, new spatial or current configuration. Now, when I draw this picture intrinsically, I'm drawing it in such a way that I'm assuming right, the motion is a lot and the shape of the object changes considerably. So in other words, uh, the deformations that we observe here are large. One says that the deformations are either large or sometimes one says that the deformations are finite. Okay. Um, versus the case when the deformations are small or infinitesimal, okay? So, and that's where this special topic of linear elasticity fits in. So, we have the reference configuration. It's going to be subject to some forces. There are supports. There are displacement boundary conditions. And this object deforms. But you can barely perceive the extent to which it deforms, okay? So, that's a good approximation. So, you can easily perceive, in some instances, the amount of deformation and linear elasticity eventually may be applicable. But theoretically, what you would like to have is a deformation that is just barely perceivable. Okay? So black is the reference, and R is the current configuration when the deformations are small, or as I said, infinitesimal. Um, so that is what we will talk about today, right? And actually, the topic of the next lecture will again be elasticity, but for that case. Okay. Um, right. So, well, um, small. Well, nice. But how small is always the question, right? So to, to uh, somehow discuss how small, let me introduce a representative length scale, let me call it capital L, it's just, well, the, the, the object itself might have uh, immensely different dimensions. So for instance, if you have a plate or a shell or this paper, for instance, 
right, or a membrane, whatever, but a structure whose one, one, of, one of the directions is much less than the other directions, right? Then what is L? So here I'm assuming that I have a sub object that looks like this. So you choose one of the dimensions because their order of magnitude in all directions is more or less the same, okay? Um, I'll come back to this remark with very thin bodies. Um, all right, so that's just one length scale and L therefore now is some representative uh, dimension. Now, in order to uh, work with small deformations, it's um, useful, uh, even for large deformations, it's useful to introduce the concept of a displacement vector, which is the difference between the current and the uh, referential positions of the object, right? So here it looks a little bit funny because this is a referential object. I add to it something and all of a sudden I'm in the current configuration. But often what one has is a common origin with respect to which I assess the position. And x is not just some any referential position vector. It indicates, uh, as I said, that was our choice specifically, the undeformed configuration of the object. So initially the object is there. Presently, it's there, and their difference is simply the displacement vector. So mathematically, there appear to be complications, but in practice, uh, one can easily define a displacement vector. Okay. Um, so then, if you go ahead and calculate the deformation gradient, that is going to be the referential gradient of the position vector. So we have identity plus del u, del x, okay? So the, sorry, let's do it explicitly, capital X over capital X, okay? So this here is identity, and this is a tensor that one typically calls H, which is the displacement gradient tensor. All right, so now having defined these quantities, now we can talk about what small means. And rigorously, this would go under the topic of linearization. Okay. Um, I'm going to just discuss this uh, in a very informal manner. Uh, but l let me start, first of all, by defining what small is. Small deformation for us uh, means that the magnitude of the deformation, the displacement gradient tensor is much, much less than one, okay? So if the displacement gra gradient is zero, there is no deformation, right? F is equal to identity, okay? So, uh, well, clearly there could be a rigid body translation and F would still be equal to identity, right? So if you look at this expression here, if this is a constant everywhere, then there is a translation, but translation, there is no rotation, there is no strain whatsoever. So we can always restrict that by appropriate boundary conditions or, uh, yeah, right, by appropriate boundary conditions. So that's not what I would worry about. So. Uh, excluding that scenario, if h is small, if h is actually zero, then it's like u is not there, so there is no deformation. So if h is small, then I talk about um, small deformation. And in terms of representative dimensions, because h is the gradient of u in the reference configuration, and now I'd like to go back and just, just correct this. It looks like a very small x. I'll make that a large x, so that's del u del capital X, right? So now I look at, uh, I, I measure some u in the structure, okay? Perhaps if you like the largest u that you uh, can find. 
So that would be a vector. And again, that as well, that this seems to be an unfortunate uh, H expression. I forgot many things. Okay. So uh, H del U del X, right? So you would find the, let's say, the maximum U in your, uh, in your, uh, throughout the structure and scale it by, so it's like a gradient, right, in terms of dimensions, scale it by your represented dimensions. So if this is supposed to hold, then this probably will also hold. So this is a practical way of checking whether your deformations are small or not. But what we have to be careful about is what this expression entails. It doesn't only mean that the strain is small. In other words, the stretches are small. It means also the rotations are small. Why? Because F, for instance, could be pure rotation. It would be a proper orthogonal tensor. And it could be large rotation. So in other words, it could be far, far from identity. In that case, if you calculate H equals F minus identity, this will be something very large. So if you have a large rotation, this will also be violated. So not only stretches should be small, but also rotations should be small. And that's something we have to keep in mind. So this is small rotations as well as small stretch. Okay. Now, since H is now something small, if I have quantities that are uh, expressible as nonlinear functions of H, directly or indirectly, I should be able to simplify those expressions. So for instance, if I have in some expression h squared times something, right? h is very small, so h squared is going to be even smaller. And it might make sense to exclude those terms. In other words, it would make sense to only retain the terms which are linear in h, okay? That are sensitive to only this term, which is of order, let's say, small parameter epsilon. So that is the concept of linearization. And there is a very rigorous way of doing that by introducing proper concepts of derivatives that are applicable to functions of tensors, etc. Uh, but I'm going to do this, as I said, in a very informal manner. As I expressed before, this is my choice in the coverage of these special topics. And I will show you what the idea is be, be behind, first of all, linearized kinematics. And then we're going to also briefly discuss linearized kinetics as well. Um, so the idea is, as I said, to retain terms of order, um, let's write it like this, order h or order u over l. Okay? and drop out everything else. So now we can have a look at every expression that we have, important ones. For instance, we can look at the deformation gradient tensor, which is identity plus h. The deformation gradient tensor is already linear h. There is no further simplification that I can carry out. But the situation is different if you look at a quantity such as the right Cauchy green deformation tensor, f transpose f equals c, right? So now, if I plug in the expression for f in there in terms of h, then we can calculate, for instance, the Lagrangian strain tensor, which is 1 half c minus identity. And I'll go ahead and I'll substitute what c is in there. So it's 1 half identity plus h transpose, which would be identity plus h transpose. Okay. That's the transpose of F times F minus identity. Okay, so in here you would obtain an identity first of all that would cancel with that one. And then you would obtain an H transpose plus H over two plus one half H transpose H. Okay, that would be the result. That is E, capital E, the Lagrangian strain tensor. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so when I look at this expression now, I see terms which are linear in H, and I see a quadratic term. Now, if H is small, this quadratic term should be much less, much smaller than the components of this tensor as a whole, and therefore the components of this one should be negligible in magnitude, right? So, and that's the assumption that we're going to make. We're going to omit this term. Okay. Um, and the remaining part is what we are going to dis define as epsilon, okay? And so the whole thing is, as a result, equal to approximately equal to epsilon, and that approximation gets better and better as h becomes smaller and smaller in magnitude. Um, and this is called the infinitesimal strain tensor because it is the, uh, the expression for epsilon is this, and this is a good approximation of the Lagrangian strain tensor when deformations are of infinitesimal magnitude. And notice that it inherits the symmetry property of the Lagrangian strain tensor, so epsilon is also symmetric. Now, nice, that's uh, one expression for the strain. You might ask, well, there was another expression, at least one other expression. Uh, let's have a look at also the uh, Eulerian strain tensor. So that would be in terms of the left Cauchy-Green deformation tensor, FF transpose. So from that, following the same line of uh, calculation, I would have um, this time small e, which is 1 half identity minus B inverse. And now the idea is to throw in the expression for F into B. And here, what we can recall is a, so, so when I do that, I need to calculate F inverse. F inverse for the case, so that would be F inverse, for the case when H is small. And so I can do an expansion, uh, a series expansion, a power series expansion of that term of this expression, so that would be identity uh, minus h plus h squared minus h minus h cubed plus etc. And therefore, f inverse when h is small is approximately equal to identity minus h. Okay. So I'll go ahead and plug in the expression for f in b by already assuming that h is small. So what I would have here is 1 half b inverse is f minus transpose f inverse. So f minus transpose would be I, so identity minus f minus transpose i minus h transpose, and then f inverse, which would be i minus h. So I've already simplified the expression. And now I can go ahead and multiply things. Uh, so that would be an identity cancels with that one. I would have a h transpose. Uh, I would have a, so let me see. No, that's right. I would have a um, h transpose plus h minus h transpose h. Okay. So one half h transpose plus h minus this time versus a plus one half h transpose h. But it really doesn't matter. And in fact, what I should do here is already not write an equal sign, but approximate equal to sign, uh, because I've already made the assumption of h is small. So that cancels out. And again, what I do is I omit this higher order term. And now what I observe is that the linear term, linear term of E in terms of H is again e equal to epsilon. So this is equal to epsilon. Okay. So now, remember, the concept of strain is something that serves eventually implicitly the purpose of relating deformation to stress. 
And the strain has some particular desirable properties that any strain tensor actually should satisfy, like rotation should not play a role in it, and uh, well, typically it's symmetric, etc. cetera. Um, now, all such strain tensors, it turns out, and we've seen two, we've seen E, and we've seen small e, but there was at least one other that I had defined, which was sort of a parametrization of the Lagrangian strain tensor, not in terms of a quadratic u, but an arbitrary u, um, or arbitrary exponent of u, right? If you take those strain tensors, it turns out that just like e, capital E and small e, all of them eventually simplify to epsilon. In other words, when deformations are small, all strain measures are equal. There is no difference between them. And we call all of them epsilon, and they have this expression, okay? So that's nice, actually, because, right, there are different definitions of strain, but for the case when deformations are small, they all fall down to one basic definition, which is this. There is, let's say, a unique definition of what the strain is. So all strain measures are equal. And that's the message here. Okay, so I'll write down one more thing and I'll go back to this concept and discuss it uh, briefly a little bit more. So there's one more practical issue and that's when we would like to take derivatives in the form of divergences or gradients or curls. Uh, so linearized derivatives are also needed and the discussion here is the comparison of derivatives with respect to referential or spatial position vectors. And let me start off with capital X. Um, so this is the definition of the displacement gradient tensor, del U del capital X. And now let me write this out as a chain rule as such. Okay, so that's del U del sm small x. And that is the deformation gradient tensor, F equals identity plus H. So now I go ahead and multiply this through, and I obtain del U del small x plus del U del x H. Okay, so the way we would think of these terms is now as follows, right? So here you have some difference in U. Let's say we approximate this. I pick two points. Their displacements differ by a certain amount, and I pick the difference between the positions between those points. That would be approximation of this pointwise derivative, right? Now, this is like capital X plus a small amount of displacement, but the displacement is very small. So verse compared to the capital X that it augments, the difference is very small. So this is almost like capital X, in fact. And that's what we're going to try and discuss. Okay? So just by looking at that term, this is already like capital. If you divide something by, let's say, u over some large number plus a small number, it's the same as u over a large number. Okay? Large number is capital X. Small number is the displacement, right? So this is or should be already like del u del capital X, okay? So I'm going to eventually discuss indeed that this term is of order H, it should be. And that's a little bit easier to see because for sure this term is at least of order H, for sure, because there's a displacement in it. And there's another H there, so this term is for sure at least of order H squared. So this is of order H squared and when the displacement gradient is small, this term should drop out. And now on the left hand side is I have del u del x, and so what I have here when the deformations are small should indeed be of order h. Okay? So when the deformations are small, okay, so let me first write this. Okay, so I'm writing it like this. It's not that it's necessarily, it necessarily starts with terms of h squared. It is at least of order h squared. Um, so this is approximately equal to 
del u del small x. Okay. So in other words, the message here is when you are taking derivatives in a linearized setting, for the purpose of taking derivatives, you don't have to distinguish between referential and spatial vectors. In other words, when you talk about a position vector, in fact, in a linearized kinematic setting, there is only one position vector. A material point has one position. Yes, it gets perturbed away from that position with, through a small displacement. That displacement is u. You don't explicitly define the current position, if you like. There is the, let's say, the, the referential position. Okay? It's almost equal to the spatial one. So there is one position. And in addition, at that point, there is another variable, which is the displacement vector. And now, if you want to calculate the gradient, you can take the gradient with respect to either small x or capital X, because they don't matter. And hence, why do we keep two? We just will eventually keep one position vector. In fact, um, um, uh, convenience dictates that one chooses small x. Okay? Does that mean referential or, uh, or spatial position vector? Really, it doesn't matter. It's, they're the same. Okay? Okay. But if, it, if that disturbs you, you can always think that when you see a book in a linearized kinematic setting, then the position vector is the referential one. Okay? That would be perhaps a. Uh, let's say, a more clean expression. Okay. So that is a gradient. The same thing goes for divergence. The same thing goes for uh, curl. All right. So for all of those cases. And I'm going to keep this in mind. And eventually, when I write the balanced law in the linearized kinematic setting and kinetic setting, so I'm going to make use of that observation. Um, all right. So now. Now that we discussed uh, kinematics, and as I said, it's partially hand-waving. We're not doing it rigorously, but I guess you get the message here. So now I want to move on to uh, linearized kinetics. But before I do that, let's have a look at that expression because it's important. We have to keep in mind that we are defining quantities that are motivated by a domain of interest. And that domain of interest is small deformation. And I've defined what that means. In that domain of interest, this is a quantity that characterizes strain. Okay? But now let's think about what strain means for us. So first of all, if h is small, deformation is small, but strain should not have, in our general definition, anything about rotation. It should filter out rotation, right? But I've already told you that, so first of all, let's recall the general case. f pointwise is equal to? R u, let's say. U goes into the strain, R is the rotation part. R does not appear in the strain, right? So now this at the same time is always I plus H. This is always also true. If F would be pure rotation, U would not be there. So H would certainly be related to rotation. If the rotation is large, H would also, H would also be large, etc. And that's what I've already said. So now suppose. I have a deformation where there is negligible strain, in fact, or uh, stretch. Let's say this is equal to 0. And however, there is an appreciable rotation. Is h small? It's not small. Then is epsilon equal to 0 because I have pure rotation? It's not 0 because h is large. And if h is large, that's it. Epsilon, which is supposed to indicate something about strain, and which is supposed to be precisely zero because it's pure rotation, is not anymore pure rotation. It's actually significantly non-zero. So in other words, I have a definition of strain that is absolutely meaningless if the rotations are large. Okay? But that's exactly what we have to be careful about. This definition is particular only to the small deformation setting. Okay? If the deformations are not small, then the definition itself is not meaningful. OK, so that's the first message. This message. The second message is, well, if I'd like to characterize small in the small deformation setting what the stretches are, then this is the quantity that I employ. What if I want to characterize rotations in the small deformation setting? 
what would be the quantity that I would employ. And uh, this perhaps is not a really intuitive question, but it turns out that the answer is very small, simple. The characterization of rotation in the infinitesimal deformation setting, in other words, by assuming that h is small, is actually a tensor which corresponds to not the symmetric part of h. This is what it is, right? Epsilon is equal to h symmetric. right? If you calculate a quantity which reaches h skew part, in other words, 1 half h transpose minus h, that's a skew tensor, that is the thing that characterizes rotation in the small deformation setting. Okay? And that is a concept that is sometimes useful, again, when you want to solve problems analytically in the uh, linearized elasticity uh, approach. Right? But that's just a uh, remark. So I can write it over here, if you like. <coughs> small um, strain is associated with epsilon equals h symmetric small rotation okay, is associated with a tensor. Let's not pick a symbol for it because we're not going to use it, but it's associated with the skew part of h. Okay. So I just wrote that down because we're talking about linearized kinematics, and kinematics entails not only strain, but sometimes you're interested in the amount of rotation, and that's how you would characterize it. Um, all right, so now that we've made those remarks as well, let me go back to uh, linearized kinetics. Right, if the rotation is small, you, you will always have rotation. But what I need is that the rotation be small. If the rotations are small and the stretches are small, this is how you characterize strain. And this is how you characterize the rotation part. If the rotations and stretches are large, both definitions are, uh, would fail. This is how you would characterize implicit the strain. That goes into capital E, let's say. This is how you would characterize rotation. Further question? All right, so let me go to linearized kinetics. Now, here we're going to go a little bit ahead of, our, of, of ourselves because we really haven't talked about um, constitutive relations that relate deformation to stress. But to talk about linearized kinetics, I at least have to tell you or offer a simple expression that does serve that purpose, right? So when we were discussing in the last part of, uh, of, of laws of motion, I said, well, we have so many equations, so many unknowns. Unless I relate deformation to stress, I'm short of equations. And I realized that by, uh, through constitutive formulations, right? Um, and one simple expression would be to say, for instance, and that's what we're going to employ in nonlinear non elasticity for salt materials. We're going to say that the stress, and I'm here choosing one, there are many definitions of, just like strain, many definitions of stress in the general setting, right? And I've chose the first purely Kirchhoff stress tensor. And it's a two-point tensor, but uh, I picked this hat just as to indicate that I'm dealing with some function of f, OK? Now, it's a function of the deformation gradient. There's some motion, and hence there is a stress uh, in general, OK? But that function is very special. Um, without going into further detail about exactly what that would look like, we're going to have a chance to discuss that, in fact. I'm going to say that it's a function such that if I throw in identity, in other words, no deformation, then the outcome should be equal to 0. Okay? Now, not only that, if I throw in pure rotation, the outcome should also be equal to 0. But uh, let's omit that complexity for a second. Okay? So. Um, OK, so no deformation, no stress. Now, keeping that in mind, and sorry, I have to change my pen. 
keeping that in mind, and I have to say something about the stress, uh, because I want to linearize now this expression, which is a function of f, and f is a function of linear function of h. So p is implicitly a function of h now, right? And is it a linear function? In general, not. It's not even a simple nonlinear function. Sometimes it's a function of the whole history of f, which means that at a certain point, you want to calculate the stress, okay? And at that time instant, you have a certain value of f. But it turns out the value of the stress at that point, at that time, is not only determined by the value of f at that point at that time, but all the values of f at that point that have occurred in the past. Okay? That's a strange concept, but you don't need to complicate it so much. I'll give you a very simple uh, example to that complication, viscoelasticity, which you have seen in your undergraduate studies. Okay? In that case, the history of the deformation goes into the determination of the stress. Okay? So, but let's assume that it's a simple function. Is it a linear function? In general, not. F will appear nonlinearly in this function, and therefore H will appear nonlinearly. All right, now keeping all of those in mind, let me go ahead. Actually, this is also a kinematic, kinematical quantity, but we're going to need it now, so let me deal with it now. So I'm going, I want to linearize the determinant. Now this part you can, if you like, do yourself, uh, as a side exercise, you can show that the determinant of f expressed like this, when h is small, is approximately equal to 1 plus trace of h. Okay. Right. So if h is small, j is equal to 1. Okay. Uh, there, is no, there, is, there is negligible deformation. So now rho naught is equal to rho j. Okay. And through as in the same, well, following the same argument, similar argument to what we discussed about gradients, right? So rho naught is a constant. Now j is a term of term that is linear in uh, h. Rho is at least a term that is also linear in h. You can multiply these things out, and you can show that uh, rho naught is approximately equal to rho in the linearized setting. Because I have two terms, rho times 1 plus rho times trace h. The second term is at least quadratic in h. You would drop that out. What you're left with is rho. So in the linearized setting, when you see a density, which one is it? It doesn't matter. There is only one. Okay? If you like, it's the referential one, but it's customary to use rho as a notation. Um, all right, so once we keep that in mind, let me now look at the Cauchy stress tensor, which is, in terms of the first piola kirchhoff stress tensor, 1 over J P F transpose. So now this is approximately equal to 1 over 1 plus trace H. So I've substituted the approximation for the Jacobian in there, uh, times P times identity plus H transpose. And now, this is 1 over 1 plus a very, very small number. The leading expression is uh, 1, so I'm going to drop this first term. And I'll be left with approximately P plus PH transpose. Okay. The second term, so, so if H is 0, or yeah, right, if h is 0, f is equal to identity, p is equal to 0. So this term is at least linear in h. I have a term that is at least quadratic in h. And as the deformations are small, what I see is that I would, of course, then retain only the terms that are linear in h for p when I do this linearization. So this would have a functional dependence. I would expand that, let's say, through a Taylor series or whatever. And then I would only retain terms that are of order h because h is so small. And then what I see is that this term can be omitted. And I'm left with t is approximately equal to p. Okay. Um, so that's the message here. Okay, t is approximately equal to p. Now you can also look at s. s is equal to f inverse p, the second pillar Kirchhoff stress tensor. And likewise, you can look at also the Kirchhoff stress tensor, and for that matter, any stress tensor that you're interested in. 
Uh, so this one would be approximate equal to identity minus h. So I plugged in the approximation for f inverse when h is small. That's equal to p. I already assumed h is small, so this term has to be of order h, eventually minus h p, which is of order h squared. The second term, again, you would drop out, and what we see is that s is approximate equal to p. So what we have found out is that t is approximate equal to p, is approximately equal to s in the linearized setting. And therefore, it doesn't make sense to really distinguish them. And it doesn't really make sense to pick this one or that one or that one as a special measure of stress. So I'm going to use a special notation. And I'm going to call it sigma. And that would be our infinitesimal stress tensor. And it will be necessarily symmetric because even if you don't see it in P, P is approximately equal to T, and T is symmetric, and so is S. Okay? So it inherits the symmetry property of the Cauchy stress tensor, if you like. And so the message here was that all stress measures are equal in the linearized setting. Okay. So if we're talking about, uh, let's say, solid mechanics, I wouldn't really worry about the density. The density is the referential one. Uh, we could just indicate that with a rho, let's say, right? That's out of the, uh, let me say, complication. And to worry about angular momentum balance means enforcing the symmetry of the stress, but that's already implicit in our construction of the Cauchy stress tensor. Um, and um, we're going to enforce that eventually. But, and sigma inherits the symmetry of T, and therefore angular momentum balance is also satisfied. So the only thing I have to worry about in an infinitesimal setting if I want to solve the equations is the linear momentum balance. So, Linear momentum balance is what I'm interested in. Now, how do I express the linear momentum balance? Well, it's the divergence of stress. Referential or spatial form, both are the same. But in the referential form, I would have the referential divergence of P. In the spatial one, the spatial divergence of T. Now, in this case, referential or spatial, it doesn't matter. I would write a small div. That's the customary notation. If you like, this does refer to the referential positions, but there is no distinction anyway in terms of calculation. So that's a divergence. And here I'm going to write the stress. Which stress? It doesn't matter. There is only one, a unique stress tensor in the infinitesimal setting, and that's sigma. Plus density times a body force. Which density? I'll pick rho. And density times acceleration. And the acceleration is typically expressed in terms of the displacement, grade, displacement vector. So that is the expression for um, linear momentum balance. Okay. And now I understand why I'm picking div, why I'm writing rho, and what sigma means. But that equation in itself is not enough because this is just three equations, three unknowns in there, six additional unknowns there. I need six additional equations. And that's going to eventually come through an expression that relates stress to, let me write hat, the strain or the history of strain or whatever. Which strain? Well, there is only one, and that's epsilon, one half h plus h transpose. Okay? So that's a unique definition of strain. So this is now, here you see everything that you need in order to deal with uh, small deformation mechanics. Okay? Um, well, that's with respect to, so, so he's, right. 
So there are actually several questions there. So he's asking, well, I def assume deformations to be small, right? So now u double dot is derivative with respect to time. Is that necessarily small? No, because you can have you can actually feel when an object vibrates, right? Like you put your hand on the hood of your car and you can still the, feel the vibration. That's a small vibration, but it's certainly there, right? It's not something you can omit. If you want to design a nice, let's say, hood or a car that doesn't you know, uh, wobble a lot when your engine starts, then the design involves some vibration analysis, and that's that term, let's say. I'm, some very gross examples here, but um, so uh, that's not omittable. Likewise, second spatial derivatives are also not omitted. What we're simplifying is the term we're taking derivatives with respect to is it the spatial position or referential? We're saying that doesn't matter. But the derivatives of displacement with respect to either position, say referential one, or time, they are significant. We cannot omit them. Okay, but that's a fair question. Further questions? OK, so now this here is the general expression for what you need uh, in small deformation mechanics. But I will now focus on that expression in the case when we talk about elasticity. That's my goal. OK, so let's move towards that purpose. So I'll talk about the material model so material model means I, I'm trying to, uh, that, that's one typical expression. An alternative one is constitutive formulation. Okay, and no matter which one you pick, the goal is to relate deformation to stress. And here I think it's useful to recall, again, a picture that I've drawn before at least once. Um, we could do a tension test, and there we would exert a certain force, let's say F. Well, let's, I think previously I used P, so the force is P, and uh, I would have a cross-sectional area. If the deformations are small, this would be either the referential or the spatial um, configuration, but let's take the cross-sectional area to be the referential cross-sectional area, and before deformation, uh, I pick a certain length region along this tension test specimen, and that would be my gauge portion of the specimen. Here, let's say, at those two points, you would attach your extensometer, and through those points, you would monitor the stretch of your sample. That would give you a measure of what the um, displacement eventually is. Okay? And then you have a cross-section area. You have the force that would give you together a measure of what the stress is. And then you would go ahead and uh, draw that on a plot as the result of your tension test. Okay, so this is sigma equals P over A, the engineering stress, and then we would have epsilon equals U over L, the engineering strain. And following usual visual simplifications, um, I am exaggerating the slope, obviously, and I'm idealizing the transition point to a nonlinear curve and idealizing this nonlinear curve as well. In reality, it's much steeper. Transition is not so clean. The curve itself could be a lot different, but uh, this is just to give us an idea of what we're talking about. So this is the way in which we would proceed. And if I just take a specimen and pull it all the way to breaking, all the way to fracture, this is what the curve uh, would look like, right? So this is our idealized. stress strain curve. Okay. Now, but as you've probably also discussed in an undergraduate course, so if I proceed along this line, and at some point, let's say, without proceeding beyond this particular point, if I decide 
to unload the material. Again, idealizing this unload, what we say is that we observe an unloading curve that is a straight line that's purely elastic. And assuming no yielding occurs on the way back, that straight line would go all the way and cross sigma equals zero line. And that line is precisely parallel, again, if there is no, let's say, some nonlinear effect like damage, this curve is precisely parallel to the initial curve. Okay? And that's the idea, right? Now, we're not really interested in precisely how, let's say, if I load back, how would I go back along back to the uh, origin line, etc. What we're interested in here is in, the, in this picture is two things. One, if I go like this, Without unloading, that's how the curve proceeds. If I unload at some point, that's how the curve proceeds. So it would be this curve, right? So now, I want to relate stress to strain. And there you go, I'm picking a given strain. And I want you to tell me what the stress is. So mathematically, you're doing this, or engineering um, purpose to do this test is to have a relation between stress and strain so that you can characterize your material. And if you want to eventually do an analysis that involves this material in a numerical or some theoretical setting, you'd like to be able to predict things before doing experiments so that you can design right, the, um, the, the, the structure mechanically, right, safely, et cetera. So you want to have a relation between stress and strain. Now, the question is, is that a simple function? And the answer is no, it's not a simple function. And it's not even a function as in, in the sense that we are used to from undergraduate mechanics. Because function, for a given value, should have a unique value. Here I'm picking a given strain. And what is the stress? Is it this one or is it that one? Because as I was going up, I crossed this value of epsilon, and I measured a certain stress. As I was unloading back, I crossed this value of strain, and therefore, I measured a different stress, right? So same value of epsilon, two different values of stress. So if I write just sigma as some simple function of epsilon, it will not be able to reflect this complexity, this very simple complexity. So hence the conclusion that the stress, and that's something I also mentioned a few sec minutes ago, depends not only on the current value of epsilon, but on the history of epsilon. In other words, it matters how you reach this value of epsilon. Have you reached it by just going up, or have you reached it by going up and then going back down? The history of reaching that epsilon does matter. So stress depends on the history of deformation. Um, and so when I write stress is a function of strain, what goes in here is really the whole history of strain. And that's certainly a complication. But there is a certain region in the stress-strain curve where that complication does not occur. And it is the region where we have a straight line. It's this region. So if I enlarge that region, okay, so strain has no units, and stress would be, let's say, megapascals, right? What I see is just a straight line, and the slope of the line is simply the Young's modulus. And that would be typically in terms of megapascals or gigapascals, let's say, if we're dealing with metals. And that's obviously a quantity that's greater than 0. Um, so the domain that I'm drawing here is the elastic domain. And in the elastic domain, the stress depends only on the current value of strain and not on its history. That complication is not present. Why? 
because I go start from here, I go to a certain value of strain, there is a certain value of stress, I go further up and back down to that point, it's the same value of strain, it's the same value of stress. So you're moving reversibly up and down this line and you can do so as much as you like and you would always measure the same value of stress at the same value of strain. So in the elastic domain, the complication of stress depending on the whole history of the strain does not occur and therefore, in 1D, for instance, you can write a very simple expression that relates to two. That's a simple function, sigma equals E epsilon, right? Um, all right, so that would be Hooke's law. But when the history plays a role, then even in 1D, we cannot do that. We have to be more careful. And then, well, how do we proceed in 3D is the question. What should go in there? So this is a tensor, and that's a tensor. I'd like to hear about what this thing here is. It's a fourth order tensor. Good. Why? Right, so it's like thinking in terms of linear algebra. So I have a second order tensor here, and I have a second order tensor here, and I'm looking for the simplest linear relation. Why? Because I have in the experimental line a linear relation that relates to two. So what goes in here should be a constant, not a function of epsilon, okay? hence the linearity. And I'm looking for the most general constant expression, and that's a fourth order tensor that maps a second to a second order tensor. So and that tensor is going to be our stiffness tensor. Right? So this is, in terms of order, this is second, this is second, and hence, this must be fourth order. Okay? And this is our expression for linear elasticity. So now we've talked about linear linearized kinematics and kinetics, but without saying something about the material behavior, about material modeling, um, that those equations are not complete. And now we have a closure. We have a relation between strain and stress for the special case of linear elasticity. And here I've tried to explain why that relation is special. So um, this is our stiffness tensor. Let me write that. Okay. So next time we'll have a chance to uh, discuss um, the, I'll, I'll, I'll remind you um, the form of the stiffness tensor for special material um, behavior, well, special types of material structure, isotropy in general, and isotropy depending on the microstructural constituents. And uh, eventually, we'll also see if we'll have a chance to talk about the concept of strain energy, because that's an important concept that will play a uh, central role when we want to talk about elasticity, but not in the small deformation regime, but in the large deformation regime. Okay. All right. Questions here? All right then, so I'll see you next time.